Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. Today we're gonna to talk about selecting the correct set of pistons for your 2JZ build. At the time of this video, there's nearly 300 piston options, and if you use the drop-down menu correctly, you can quickly navigate to the right set of pistons for your build. By the end of this video, you'll be able to make an educated decision on what piston is right for you based off of engine size, bore size, compression ratio, and a host of other options. Although we're talking about turbocharged engines, the displacement of the engine does affect the engine's output with great influence. The larger the engine, the faster it's gonna spool the turbo and the more average power it will make. If you ask yourself the question, should you be interested in a larger than stock displacement engine, the answers are pretty easy. What you're gonna get if you increase the stroke of the engine is an engine that has more average power. So that means instead of that thing needing to be right at 6,000 RPM, to be able to get into the throttle and have the turbo respond quickly and have a fast car right then, you gain flexibility. So you have this thing that makes power around 4,500, whereas before it was just kind of dead. The additional displacement will spool the turbo sooner, adding more low speed torque, and then it perpetuating up from there. For me personally, I was sold on the strokers early on. When I first put my anthracite car together, it was a 94 millimeter Brian Crower crank, and it helped mitigate some of that lag. So I would take somebody for a ride in the car and before you had this very lazy, unassuming, boring thing that turned into a kind of a madman when it was up on boost when the turbo spooled, but off of boost it just wasn't very cool. And with the stroker it added this personality that now the, the power came on sooner and smoother, which made it easier for me to mitigate traction and the car was just more enjoyable to drive around because it would get into boost sooner, and when it wasn't in boost, it had more torque. Now, increased displacement doesn't come without some downsides, and the first one is costs. These are aftermarket crankshafts. They're extremely nice. Most of them have improved oiling, but they come at a heavy price. So that could be enough when you are shopping for engine parts to say, nah, I'm gonna take that option off the plate. If you can work through the cost option and you're ready to continue to have an increased displacement engine, the next downside would be there are stroke configurations that are not right for 8,500 plus RPM. Now, some of the numbers I'm gonna give here are just based off of my experience. It's not like you turn an engine 9,100 RPM and it just shatters into pieces. I mean, I've turned 94 millimeter 2JZ is 10,000 RPM and they didn't blow up. They just don't live as easily because of the internal leverage and having that piston pull down further out of the bore and the rod having to be more angled to push it back up the bore. It's just internal friction. It's, it's that simple. It's why super high RPM engines have low stroke and low RPM engines have high stroke. What we're trying to do is find the best balance we can in the RPM window we're gonna operate the engine in. If you're coming to me for advice and you have a synchronized transmission and a stock style oiling system, but you have the budget for the stroker, I feel completely confident saying, get into that 94 millimeter crank. It's gonna make for a better averaging, more enjoyable car on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're a guy that has a dry sump in a dog box or sequential trans, or a dry sump in a very loose torque converter that you're gonna be operating the engine, say 8,000 RPM to 10,000 RPM, then I don't really want you in a 94 millimeter crank. I would say get into a 90 millimeter crank or a stock 86 millimeter crank. The reason why we select the engine configuration first is it dictates where the compression height is on the piston. So the compression height is the center line of the pin bore to the top of the piston. If the compression height is wrong, the piston can be down below the deck of the engine block or up above the deck of the engine block. Either case doesn't work out. So the stroke and the rod length dictate the compression height of the piston along with the deck height of the block. So select your configuration, that narrows your field down and you can move on to bore size and compression ratio. Moving into bore size, the 2JZ comes with an 86 millimeter bore. It can be bored out to 87.5, but you wouldn't want to go from 86 to 87.5 in one shot because you wouldn't leave any rebuilds in the future. Another thing is the more material that you remove from the bore, the thinner the cylinder wall becomes. In order for that cylinder to stay round and keep shape during the dynamic state of the engine running, you want to remove the least amount of material it takes to get a perfectly round hole that's the right size for your new pistons and has the right finish for your new rings, supplying lubrication to the ring set and the piston and providing a good seal for the engine moving forward. It is my opinion, along with many other engine builders, that you wouldn't take a well-used block and put a new set of standard-sized pistons in it. 
just getting the home finish right is gonna be one to two thousandths if there's no scoring. So you end up with this larger than necessary, larger than recommended, larger than what you should be allowing piston wall clearance, which is gonna create an engine that is noisy, has oil consumption problems, and does not have very good ring seal. If you're working on an air compressor that blew up, putting a stock piston back in the air compressor is okay. It has one job, it's just gonna do its thing as an air compressor. We're talking about building a performance engine and we should do the steps accordingly to have a successful program. Now that we're through engine configuration and bore size, we can talk about compression ratio. If you go back in time, 40 or 50 years, engine compression ratios were lower because the fuel quality was not that good. As fuel's gotten better, and Japan introduced turbocharged cars to the US market through the 80s and 90s, most of them settled on a high seven to mid eight compression ratio. And the reason why they did this is they needed the engine to live not only through warranty, but beyond. So the factory 2JZ is an eight and a half to one compression ratio. And if you use premium fuel in it, it's a really hard engine to tear up. So if you're rebuilding your 2JZ and you're gonna be using say US market pump fuel, the factory compression ratio is a really nice place to be. If you're gonna marry a alcohol-based fuel like ethanol or methanol, you can step that compression ratio right up to 10 to one. The engine will make more power at the same boost level because you've got more cylinder pressure and more heat in the cylinder. But what you don't wanna do is build a 10 to one 2JZ that you're gonna run on US market pump fuel because by the time you get the boost level low enough that the engine isn't gonna be knock prone, you'll be making less power than had you just left the stock compression ratio and let the thing eat 18 or 20 pounds of boost on pump gas. So you're balancing this act, but you're gonna pick compression ratio based off of the fuel you're gonna run in the engine. You don't wanna build an engine that you're stuck to one fuel and can't make a change because then if that fuel becomes inaccessible or expensive, what will you do with the car? This is a long haul question. You have to think hard about this and you have to make the right decision. Here on the table, I've grabbed some pistons out of inventory. We can kind of look over them and see the differences. It's worth noting that these are all full skirt pistons. None of these have a shrunk down slipper skirt design that you would see in a lightweight max effort naturally aspirated piston. And the reason being is you want a turbo piston or a supercharger piston to be pretty beefy with a lot of material and its ability to keep shape. Small skirt pistons like those slipper designs, they're good in any engines, but when you're dealing with the loads inside of a boosted engine, a, a round part is a longer living part. Moving through that, we can talk about what's here on the table. This is a JE Ultra. They have done a really nice job with these parts. It comes with a horizontal gas port, it comes with a coated crown and a coated skirt. It's a nice part, high value part, a lot of the things that if you went into a full custom piston, you'd option for is in a shelf component here in this JE Ultra. This is a Manly. It comes with a coated skirt. It's done on a very high level machine that if you look, there's some notches in the undersides of the skirts and that's how the piston is held. And this piston does not come out of the machine a bunch of times. And Manly's reasoning is, that all of the machining parameters can be held to a better standard if the part doesn't get taken out of one machine and put into another. This is a proven part. We used this part and helped develop it in a engine dyno video many years ago, and I've taken it to Bonneville and gone over 300 miles an hour with it. It's a tough part. It's a good resource for all of us. The next piston is the Wiseco. This is the only part on the table that's hard anodized. So if you look at it, it's got quite a different color than the other pistons on the bench. Top Fuel's been using hard anodizing for a number of years. It helps in a few different ways. The first train of thought is that it prevents micro welding in the ring land. So any friction welding that can occur from the ring chattering in the ring land, it protects against that. It rejects heat out of the piston into the cylinder wall and into the combustion chamber where they think helps the efficiency of the engine. And it also is an overall hard coat on the piston, making it a harder part all around. Around. It also has a coated skirt and it has these what they call anti-detonation grooves on top between the top of the piston and the top ring. It's got these really small grooves and what they're thinking is that it slows down the out of control pressure ratios that happen during detonation and pressure waves traveling down the sides of the piston that can damage the top ring. The next part on the table is this CP shelf piston. These are really nice parts. Uh, don't let the fact that it doesn't have a coating on it deter you from having confidence in this brand. 
This has been a go-to brand of mine since the early 2000s, and it's the only shelf part of the table that has dual pin oilers, which is a great option for a forced inducted part. So it's gonna be using oil from the oil ring, directed right into the piston pin bore, and that will help keep galleon from happening on the pin as the part changes shape during operation. These are really, really nice pistons. Uh, a lot of people equate them to the jewelry of pistons because the finish work is incredibly nice. They really do a knockout job out there at CP. The next piston we'll look at is a diamond. This is a custom part. It's gonna go into a 2JZ with a 96 millimeter crank. This piston has horizontal gas ports, a coated skirt. It has underhead milling. And what they're doing there is just removing what they value as unneeded weight out of the bottom of the piston. These are nice parts and the guys up there at Diamond pride themselves on a fast turnaround on custom parts while providing an excellent value. The next one in the lineup is our RS1600. This is a part that I'm proud of to say the least. Um, we've been building a lot of engines over the years here, a lot of 2JZs and a lot of abuse. And this part's been really, really solid to me for those guys that want you know 1200 to 1600 horsepower. This is a go-to part. It's really a tough forging, horizontal gas port. So if you're running it on pump gas, you don't have to worry about sitting up the gas ports like you would on a vertical gas port. And it also has the CP groove at the top, which they're just allowing additional combustion to get behind that top ring and push it against the cylinder wall. Again, with the dual pin oilers and a coated skirt, this is a nice part. And if you're in that 1200 horsepower, 1600 horsepower range, this is a go-to for me. And I can't say it will let you down. This is a very solid piston. The last one is the RS2000. I would say that this is not for guys that are gonna be making you know, 1500 horsepower. You can do that with this piston just fine. This is for guys that are aluminum rod, dry sump, big turbochargers, 10,000 RPM. The guys that are really, really gonna be bringing the abuse. You wouldn't wanna use this part in a lesser engine because it's, it's a heavy part that's designed to deal with a heavy level of abuse. It also has a coated skirt and it has vertical gas ports, which if you look at that, the gas ports are from the top of the piston down to the top ring. And with an alcohol-based fuel, this is the way that I prefer to do it. If you're gonna be using a pump fuel, I would have you in horizontal gas ports. I wanted to jump back onto coatings for a second. Not all of these pistons have the same style of coating. The CP coating is more for break-in and conforming to the cylinder wall. Whereas this Manly has like a long haul coating that the OEM started to adapt in the late 90s, early 2000s. The skirt coat is a valuable thing. Anytime that you have lubrication that is marginal or displaced, a coating can buy you time before you have metal on metal contact. So any of these pistons that have a skirt coat on there, take that as an add on. It is a benefit to you and, and worth having as you build your engine. Now that we've covered pistons, let's take a minute to talk about piston pins. Piston pin job is pretty simple. It holds the piston to the connecting rod. In an engine like a 2JZ that's gonna make a thousand horsepower or more very easily, you wanna make sure that you're using a pin that's strong enough that it's not gonna bend or break. I wouldn't use a piston pin that with a wall thickness thinner than say 225 thousandths if you're gonna be using the engine in the thousand to 1200 horsepower range. Above that, I like the insurance of these trend pins. This is a custom piston pin and it's a through hardened pin instead of a surface hardened pin. So if you had a surface hardened part and a through hardened part in the same wall thickness, the through hardened part is considerably stronger. They're available coated or uncoated and we order ours with a DLC coating. The DLC coating offers a incredible low friction coefficient. So it's a very slippery coating. It's a very hard coating and it offers excellent wear resistance. So. While you're running the engine and the part is flexing like this, you can get galling in the pin bores, which we've seen over the years in a number of engines. Well, with a coated pin, you just polishes that pin bore up. So when the lubrication is displaced because the parts are flexing, the DLC coating offers a large amount of protection from those surfaces that are touching from becoming scarred and becoming wear items where they can then start to deteriorate. So it's a good value adder inside of your engine. I hope this information has been helpful and you're able to select the pistons that you need for your build. I know that that nearly 300 number is pretty complicated and as you narrow it down, you'll be able to use the information that we've provided to make a good decision. If you still need some help, feel free to reach out to us. It's why we're here.